in there. Hello, and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Home Discovery Series. Today's program is Slithering Snakes. And we are so lucky to have with us a very special guest, Tiana Johnson. Tiana is an East Stroudsburg University graduate student, snake researcher, team leader for the Northwest region of ESU's Timber Rattlesnake Research, and McKean County Coordinator for PARS, Pennsylvania Amphibian and Reptile Surveys. But the best part is, Tiana is also one of Hawk Mountain's Fall 2020 Conservation Education Trainees. Hello guys, this, uh, I'm Tiana and this is my assistant TA. This is my cousin Cece. So we're happy to be here. And thank you. Thank you, Jamie, for having us. Thank you both so much for joining us today. My name is Jamie Dawson. I'm the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, and we are so glad that all of you in the audience are joining us today as well. Hawk Mountain is the world's very first sanctuary for birds of prey, and we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education locally and globally around the world. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit, and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members, thank you so very much for your continued support. And if you're joining us today and you're not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone remains safe and healthy during these times of COVID challenges. And we are thrilled to offer our community a variety of free virtual programming. As always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates and depends on donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded. The video will then be posted in Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website directly connecting you to our YouTube channel. At any point during today's program, viewers may submit questions through the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform. We've designated some time at the end of the program to take some questions from the audience. And we are so excited that you all are joining us today as we explore the scaly, the slithering, the secretive, the sometimes misunderstood, but always super spectacular world of snakes. So for today's program, first we're gonna talk about the general characteristics of snakes. And then we're going to explore some of the native snakes that can be found in Pennsylvania. Then we are going to talk with Tiana and learn some of the awesome things that she is working on with her snake research projects. And lastly, we have the opportunity to meet real live snake ambassadors. It's going to be awesome. Okay, so we are going to get started and I am going to share my screen. Okay, slithering snakes. You know, I love snakes personally, but even more so I love working with snakes as education ambassadors and I love teaching people about snakes because Snakes are often feared by many people and they're often misunderstood. And I understand not everyone has to love snakes like I do, but I hope that people can at least respect snakes and understand that they have a, certainly a very important part in our ecosystem and for all of us. So let's talk more about snakes. Also, I wanted to add that unless otherwise um, noted with photo credits or image credits um, in this presentation, um, if there's no photo credits, then I took the photo. And I just want to point out this uh, snake in the middle, this beautiful Gaboon Viper. I actually took that photo when I was doing some grade eight research in Cameroon and I spotted that, uh, that snake on the trail. Okay, so there are about 3,000 snake species in the world today. And snakes are found on every continent except Antarctica. The largest discovered snake fossil is Titanoboa, which lived 60 million years ago and was 50 feet long and over 2,500 pounds. So the snakes living today come in all different sizes. Um, the smallest snake in the world is the thread snake, which is less than four inches long. And the longest snake in the world is the reticulated python, which can grow over 30 feet long. But the heaviest snake in the world is the green anaconda, which can weigh up to 550 pounds. Snakes are a lot of things. <laughs> snakes are vertebrates, meaning they have an internal skeleton or backbone. 
Um, they are cold-blooded, which means that they are not able to generate their own body heat. So to control their body temperature or thermoregulate, they do that by changing their surroundings. If they need to warm up, maybe they'll go out and sun themselves on a rock. Or if they're too hot and overheating, maybe they'll crawl into a shadowy place or a den or maybe burrow underground. All snakes are carnivores. They are hunters. They are meat eaters. And they feed on a wide variety of prey items. All snakes are covered in scales. Uh, scales are, are dry, it's a thick skin and it covers their body, it protects them, it holds in moisture. And guess what? Scales are made out of keratin, which is the material, the same building blocks that your fingernails are made of, or even your hair. Um, so some snakes lay eggs, I would say most snakes lay eggs, but some snakes give birth to live young. Snakes crawl, they climb, and they often are good swimmers. So regardless what your personal feelings are about snakes, please know that snakes are very important to our ecosystems. They're a, a vital part of the food web um, and very important to humans. So snakes, many snakes prey on a lot of animals that would be considered pests to humans, especially rodents. And man, if we didn't have those snakes around, the rodent populations would be out of control. And as you know, rodents can spread disease and also damage human crops. So they're very important. Not to mention a lot of other animals can also um, depend on snakes as a food source, um, such as some of our beloved raptors at Hawk Mountain. <laughs> so I'm gonna stop my screen share for a second. Hello, I'm back because I wanted to show everyone some of characteristics of snakes. So we said that snakes have scales and I happen to have with me here a snake skin. Oh my goodness, maybe you'll find a snake skin when you're hiking and you can, I wish you could feel this like I am. They're dry, these scales, but I don't know if everyone knows why sna snakes shed their skin. Well, I'll tell you why. It's because scales do not stretch and grow like our skin. Um, Scales are kind of like one size. So if a snake has a big growth spurt and they haven't shed their skin, it's like wearing jeans that are too tight. Unlike our skin that grows with us as we grow, the snakes then have to peel off their old skin that's too tight and then they have grown newer, bigger scales underneath. And they even have scales over their eyes, which we call an eye cap. We'll I'll try to find one of the eyes. That's a little one. I don't know if you can see it, the little eye cap. Okay, so we said snakes are vertebrates. And this is a real snake x-ray from one of my snakes that I've been working with for over 10 years as an education animal. So my snake was looking a little lumpy. So I was like, time to go to the vet, Catalina. And the vet took this x-ray and, and Catalina was perfectly healthy, no problems. And I said to the vet, can I please keep this x-ray? Because a lot of students I work with think that snakes are invertebrates like a worm. But here is the evidence that snakes have so many bones. They have, if you can feel your backbone or your vertebrae, the snake's vertebrae go all the way down and they have so many ribs, way more ribs than we do. And we talked about how snakes have babies. Some lay eggs, many lay eggs. This is a picture of a ball python mom and she is huddled around her clutch of eggs. Now in general, most snakes lay their eggs and then they go, they go off and they leave the eggs. They don't need any parental care and the baby snakes hatch and they are ready to be independent. But what is this ball python doing? The mother ball python will stay on the clutch of eggs until they hatch, which could be 90 days, doesn't leave, doesn't eat. So we know that snakes are cold blooded so she can't keep it warm with her body. But what she does is she vibrates. She wiggles and vibrates her body back and forth. And we know that heat comes from friction. So the mother snake vibrating on those eggs helps keep the eggs warm. Speaking of eggs, oh my goodness, I have some real snake eggs here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a snake egg that was laid from a pine snake. Wow, and they don't just lay one, there are several, several in a clutch. And a little bit smaller was an egg from a bull snake. Very interesting. So, and as I mentioned earlier, some snakes do have uh, live births, such as um, like a red-tailed boa. 
actually, when the little babies are inside the snake, they are in like a gel gelatinous kind of clear egg sac. And when they're, they're, they're being born and they come out of the cloaca of the mother snake, kind of that gelatinous um, egg kind of bursts open and it's a live birth. And I'm going to have a little hand sanitizer after those snake eggs. <laughs> That's a good okay. idea. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, so I just wanted to share that with you all. And we're going to go back to the presentation. Okay, moving along. Hmm, sometimes it can be a little difficult to tell if a snake is a male or female. And that's because the reproductive organs of snakes is inside their body, so it can be hard to tell. And I'm certainly not an expert at, you know, um, sexing snakes, but here's just a little trick. Um, it can, you can, sometimes you can tell by looking at the snake by the size and shape of its tail. So the males and females have different shaped tails because inside that region is where the reproductive parts are. Uh, so the males have these uh, hemipennies right here that are inside. So they, the males have this longer, thicker tail so that they have room for those hemipennies inside where the female's tail is thinner and shorter and it kind of gradually tapers because it doesn't need that big space inside for those male reproductive organs. Um, so that's one way. And if you're ever at a vet with a snake, they will do this procedure called probing. Well, they'll, they'll stick this instrument inside the cloaca, which is the vent where they go to the bathroom to see how far it goes in. But do not do that on your own. That's strictly for a professional uh, vet. So there's another way for certain snakes, such as boas and pythons, which are popular in the pet trade. You can tell by uh, another thing around the cloaca. So here's the, here's the cloaca. Oops, sorry about that. So the cloaca is here on this snake and here. That's where they would go to the bathroom or excrete eggs. So uh, the boas and pythons have on either side of the cloaca anal spurs, or some people call them pelvic spurs. So for the males, those spurs are going to be bigger and longer, and they're going to be much smaller in the female. So that's another way that you can tell. And so interesting, what the heck are those spurs? Well, guess what? Many scientists believe that snakes evolved from lizards, but some snakes retain vestigial back limbs. Vestigial just means it's not really functioning anymore. It over evolution, there's some little remaining part of that feature on the animal, but it doesn't really serve a purpose or work anymore. So some scientists believe that these spurs are kind of the leftover or vestigial little um, uh, like legs or claws left over from when snakes evolved from lizards. So isn't that fascinating? And some scientists believe that for the males, it helps them grasp the females when they're mating. All right, it's time for a question for the audience. Can you guess what kind of snakes are in these photos? Do, 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 do. do you have in your mind or shout it out? What, what species? Well, guess what? I set you all up for failure. <laughs> because these aren't snakes at all. These are actually legless lizards. But man, you know what? They really look like snakes to me. So there are lizards without legs. So let's take a closer look at some of the differences between snakes and lizards, especially legless lizards. Okay, so one big difference are the eyes. Snakes do not have eyelids. Their eyes are always open. So if someone says to you, hey, a snake winked at me, say, stop pulling my leg. I know you're lying. Snakes don't have eyelids, right? But lizards do have eyelids, so that's one difference. Also, snakes do not have any um, external ear holes, whereas the lizard would, and here's the ear hole on the legless lizard. But does that mean snakes are deaf because they don't have external ears? No, scientists believe they can still hear, they can sense vibrations inside um, they actually have a sort of ear-like structure that's attached to their jawbone, and that structure senses vibrations from sound waves. And so scientists believe that's how snakes can still hear without having external ears. Also, snakes only have one functioning lung, whereas lizards would have two lungs. Snakes will have a forked tongue, and we'll talk more about that later, whereas the legless lizards will have a notched tongue. Also, um, 
snakes have a long body and a short tail, whereas the legless lizards, they tend to have a shorter body and a longer tail. And sometimes for a snake, it can be hard to tell where does the body end and the tail begin, but maybe we'll discover that with some of our live uh, snake educators that we'll meet later. Um, I wanted to let you all know that I do have a few videos inserted into this presentation, starting with a slide. So sometimes when we show videos, if some different people in the audience, their devices can't always handle the videos so well. So if you have other devices on or other applications open on your computer, maybe turn them off so you have a better chance at being able to view the videos. So snakes, um, snakes, it's really interesting how they eat because they can eat items that are larger than them. And we'll start with this little video. Oh, sorry, let me go back. Ah, I'm going the wrong way. Okay, let me try to find, here we are. Okay, so this is one of my education animals. This is her quarantine home. She has a nice um, enclosure at my office. But anyway, her name is Sherbert. And look at Sherbert um, eating, a corn snake is eating this mouse. And so the mouse is bigger than the snake's narrow little head and body. So what the snakes can do, they have this adaptation. They can unhinge their lower jaw and totally stretch out that skin. Um, it's very elastic. It stretches out and allows them to consume prey items that are bigger or, or wider um, than themselves, and especially their little narrow heads and necks. So I just wanted to watch. Thought you might want to enjoy that. It's very fascinating adaptation snakes have. Uh, So um, in captivity, or uh, my uh, education snakes, we do offer food once a week. They have a slow metabolism because they're cold-blooded. Okay, so next I want to show you another video of the same snake that just consumed the mouse. And now let's watch it as the snake um, kind of works that mouse through the digestive uh, system. So you so can sure see- So the corn thing just finished eating a mouse, and you can see how his body is slowly working that mouse down through his digestive system. If you can see the lump of where the mouse is right here, and it's working its way down. Okay, so you may be wondering, how does a snake breathe while it's, it's eating? Uh, its mouth is stuffed to the brim with these big prey items. How, how is it able to breathe? Well, there's another adaptation a physical adaptation called the glottis. And if you look at this picture up at, on the top right with the mouth open on the snake, can you see this? It looks like a round tube, almost like a snorkel. And actually it kind of serves like a snorkel tube. That's called the glottis. So that is how the snake breathes. And it, it's right up at the very front of its mouth. So even if its mouth is stuffed with this big prey item that it's just like consuming, that snorkel tube, that glottis is there, so there can still be air exchange and the snake can still breathe while eating, which is a very fascinating adaptation. Hydrating, has anyone ever seen a snake drink? Let's take a look. <laughs> Here we have beautiful Catalina, who's an albino bull snake, and she is enjoying a fresh drink of water Hydrating yourself, very important. Catalina. Okay, so um, that is another one of our education snakes, but it's nice to see them drinking because you don't always get to see that. Another way snakes can hydrate themselves is by absorbing water through their cloaca. So just keep that in mind as well. And again, many snakes are, um, are good swimmers, so they, they are definitely in the water. Okay, so now we are going to talk about some of the native species of snakes found in the state of Pennsylvania where Hawk Mountain is located. So there are 21 species of snakes in Pennsylvania. We have 18 constrictors and three venomous snakes. So um, constrictors means um, constrictors are harmless. So they do have no venom and they are uh, killing their prey by catching it and wrapping around it and squeezing really tight so that prey animal then can't breathe and eventually dies. And then these animals, sometimes they, the snakes can actually sense when the prey item's heart stops and then they know they can release and they uh, can begin eating. So um, 
Most people know that Sean Grace is the president of Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, but you also know that he is a snake wrangler. Sean has a very strong background as a naturalist and as an outdoor educator and um, spends a lot of time on the mountain and, um, and nearby where he lives. And this is a photo of him um, interacting with a black rat snake. And then the black uh, rat snakes or the Eastern rat snake is the largest species of snake in Pennsylvania that can get to be eight feet long. So you're gonna see him actually handling the snake and talk about it. So folks, don't try this at home. Our message is please don't touch wild snakes, but Sean is a, professor, a professional and has uh, been a, an outdoor naturalist for, for, for many years. So here's um, a little um, video. I'm with Cooper and Elden. Never saw the black red snake. <laughs> you are the man. You are the man. So it has clouded over eyes, so it looks like it did not completely shed. We're going to help it out. Why don't you go inside and uh, we should give this thing some spray with some water. No, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a black rat snake, and this is one of our common uh, constrictors here in Pennsylvania. And it'll actually probably tame down pretty much. Um, it definitely looks like something tried to get it right there. Maybe a raptor with some talons has tried to take it out. And... So, but right now, in a second, I can probably actually let him go and he's, nothing's going to happen. But it does look like he's almost blind right now. So I do want to spray his uh, eyes down with some water. And you can also see where he didn't completely shed at the tip of his nose either. And so what we can try and do is pick that off. But if you wet it down, a lot of times that will help it uh, go and then it won't it'll actually allow it to uh, completely shed, so, but. Yeah, so cool, cool little constrictor here, found right here in Pennsylvania, and we're gonna let this guy go in one more, but you can see that's a big snake, eh? Oof, oof, yeah. So almost as tall as I am. So okay, we're gonna give He's him some support. He's probably Gonna give him some support. I'm gonna pick him up, and uh, I bet if I let him go, that he won't actually even bite me now. See, he could he could reach around and bite me right now if he wanted to. So they tamed down pretty quick. Okay, cool. And the uh, thank you, Sean. And the other two photos I actually uh, of the of the black rat snake were taken uh, by our raptor care center. Um, okay, the eastern garter snake, the tiny little snake. You can see that on the left. Um, one of the most common snakes across Pennsylvania, found in nearly all habitats usually near water, but have you heard of the shorthead garter snake? There's a photo. Um, it's much less widespread than the eastern garter snake, snake um, and it's really only found in the northwestern corner of Pennsylvania, but also generally found near water. Speaking of water, here are some photos of the northern water snake. So this photo in the uh, middle, I actually took while kayaking at Leaster Lake. And this photo on the right is actually at the pond at Hawk Mountain, the pond in the native habitat garden. Um, as the name suggests, uh, water snakes are often found by the water. Um, and they're very abundant um, in, in wetland areas um, across, across Pennsylvania. And in this up photo here, you can see the eye cap um, that needs to shut off. Okay. Eastern hognose snake. I'm not going to talk too much about it because I believe Tiano is going to be talking with us later about the hognose snake. But this, these two pictures were actually taken uh, when uh, Tiana was with me last September for our raptor field course um, at one of our banding uh, stations that we work with on the Kittatinny Ridge. And I just want to point out, they have a tendency when threatened to play dead. And that's, this is what happened here. And they roll over on their back and they open their mouth and that's just to kind of get predators or, or any threat to leave them alone. Ooh, look at this pretty shade of green. Here we have uh, the smooth green snake, generally found in grassy and weedy habitats across most of Pennsylvania, except it is not found in the southeastern corner of the state. 
it is a species of special concern in Pennsylvania, and I forgot to mention that um, with the water snake as well, is also a species of special concern. And then we have the northern rough green snake, um, rarely ever found on the ground. It tends to stay mostly in shrubs or trees, in wetlands and wet meadows, and along streams, rivers, and lakes. Um, this snake is listed as endangered in Pennsylvania. Okay, so here we have the eastern milk snake. And um, the eastern milk snake is found pretty in a wide range of habitats, especially in backyards across Pennsylvania. Um, it's pretty common and abundant species, but it can sometimes be misidentified as a copperhead, which is venomous. But it's not, and one of the things um, is uh, kind of um, the patterns, the, the pattern on the head. You can see it's like a, a V shape or a Y or U-shaped blotch on the head. And that is uh, one way, among other ways, that you can distinguish it from a copperhead. And then in the middle, we have the black racer, which is a long, slender, very fast uh, snake. Um, and it looks, uh, has different markings as, um, as a young, as a juvenile, then as an adult, it, it goes into the black. Um, it really loves to climb shrubs and trees. It's a pretty common and abundant species found in meadows, farmlands, open wooded areas across Pennsylvania. And it can get to be pretty big. It can get to be about five feet long. And then a tiny snake at the end, we have the northern ringneck snake, which gets its name from that um, orange ring around its neck. And also you can see on its belly, its belly can be bright orange or also bright yellow. It's uh, pretty commonly found across Pennsylvania. Um, um, and uh, it um, eats on, if you can see the picture all the way down at the bottom, it does prey on these uh, little red Fs, these the little newts here. Um, so that's a really great little interaction in the ecosystem. Okay, so here we have the northern red belly snake and the northern brown snake. And they are definitely closely related to each other. Um, so the northern red belly snake um, it's found in forests and fields on the edges of wetland areas and streams. It's pretty abundant throughout the state, although it's rarely spotted because it spends most of its life underground. And its belly gets its name is, is pretty uh, bright red, as you can guess. And then for the northern uh, brown snake, it's also found across Pennsylvania. Um, pretty abundant, uh, hanging out in forests, grasslands, vacant lots. Okay, the queen snake. The queen snake um, is uh, pretty rare. It's a species of special concern in Pennsylvania. And what's so interesting about the queen snake is it has a very specific specialized um, prey item that it hunts. And it really loves to hunt crayfish. And that's unusual for snakes because most snakes are, are pretty much, uh, you know, generalists. They'll, they'll hunt what, what they can find and what's, what's in the area. Um, they are found uh, in places where there are healthy populations of crayfish. So obviously very much connected to the water. Um, they can get to be about two feet long. And also this is a special concern species. And here we have the Eastern worm snake and it gets its name because it does look kind of worm-like. It doesn't have this really clearly distinctly defined head. It kind of, the head just kind of blends in with the rest of its body. Um, it is also a special species of concern in Pennsylvania. It's a really small, um, found mostly in the center of the state where it habits forests, fields, streams, and wetlands. The Kirkland snake. The Kirkland snake has not been seen in Pennsylvania for more than 60 years. So it's actually listed as an endangered species in Pennsylvania. It was last seen in wetlands and wet meadows. Um, it's semi-aquatic, although it does spend most of its life underground. And then you have the ribbon snake, which is also not very common. And you can see it has these uh, very three prominent ribbon-like lines or stripes on its back, hence the name, the yellow stripes. Um, it's a special concern species in Pennsylvania, um, but it can be found in a wide range of habitats. Um, but again, it's, it's not the most uh, commonly seen. The earth snakes. The earth snakes, um, as the name suggests, they spend a lot of time underground, so they are often not seen. Uh, the mountain earth snake occurs in northwestern Pennsylvania. It's primarily in the forest, and again, it's underground. Um, it's a special concern species in the state. 
And then you have the Eastern smooth earth snake. Um, it occurs in forests and fields, bordering forests in southeastern Pennsylvania, although it hasn't been documented in the state for several years. Um, and it is also a species of special concern in Pennsylvania, spending lots of time underground. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the venomous snakes in Pennsylvania. And we have three species of venomous snakes. Um, so a lot of times people say, is that snake poisonous? But snakes don't have poison. Poison is something that the per someone or a, a living thing has to ingest the poison, whereas venom is injected. So snakes have venom. Hey, Jamie, so I'd just like to chime in. There is actually a poisonous snake in Pennsylvania, uh, the garter snake. Because they consume toads, they absorb the toad's toxins and it, it, uh, they absorb it into their, their tissues. And so they have what is called bufotoxin. That's what toads have. So they'll, they'll um, incorporate that into their tissues. And so they will, in fact, be poisonous. If you were to eat it. If you were to eat it, yes. Awesome. Thank you yeah. so much. That is, thank you for, for sharing that. That's so fascinating. Yeah, isn't that crazy? There are actually... There is a species of snake too that is venomous and poisonous to you, but it's not native to the United States. I believe it's over in Asia. It's uh, the keelback snake. So they're nowhere near here. They're way, way, way far away. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you for sharing. So a lot of people are always asking, well, if I see the snake and I'm not sure, is it venomous? Is it not? So um, First of all, always try to stay away from wild snakes. Uh, if you see one, you should like back away. But here are some general things. And uh, Tiana, feel free to uh, chime in. <laughs> so uh, not many people look for the triangular head. So uh, venomous snakes often have those venom glands at the back of their head. So that gives their, their head that triangular look. So triangular head. Also, if you look at the pupil on their eyes, the venomous snakes will often have a vertical, like slit-like pupil. Whereas um, constrictors will often have a round pupil. But I'm saying this, if you're close enough to a snake that you can see the shape of its pupil, back yeah. off, take a step back, you're too yeah. close. Um, also, uh, at least for the venomous, the three venomous snakes um, in Pennsylvania, they have a heat sensing pit um, on their nose. Okay, uh, this other figure on the left, I'm not really going, going to go into, it has to do with the plates uh, around their cloaca, their anal, you know, but that's more for like scientists in the field. That's not something for um, a regular person out hiking to, to need to know. Okay, we're gonna start with the copperhead, one of uh, the three venomous snakes in Pennsylvania. I do just wanna chime in real quick too. When you're trying to figure out if a snake is venomous or not, if you do not know what it is, if you are not 100% confident, do not pick it up. If you need to move it off of a road, use a stick or just gently scoot it along. Um, the most important thing I can stress is to rely on a multiple, uh, rely on multiple characters because there are snakes that will flatten their necks defensively and they look like they have a triangle shaped head. And uh, venomous snakes can also uh, contract their pupils and also widen them. Just like people's eyes, you know, they have pinpoint irises or they get bigger in the dark, snakes do that too. So you just wanna make sure that you're always familiar with the snakes in your area. If you're hiking or if you're in the woods camping, just rely on multiple characteristics. And if you aren't sure, just don't mess with it because otherwise you might regret it. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Tiana. And I remember reading a statistic that the majority of uh, people that have been bitten by wild snakes um, and, and had to go to like the hospital, it's because they were trying to handle and mess with and grab the snake. It wasn't the snake pro provoking them. It was the people, um, in, you know, mm -hmm. provoking the snake. Okay, yeah, so that is true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we're talking about the copperhead. Um, so copperhead often found in rocky areas, forested areas, rock ledges. Um, it is a species of concern in Pennsylvania and may be en route to being listed as threatened. So if you, they have this distinctive pattern and you're looking for this, it almost looks like hourglasses, right? It's wide on the sides and narrow along the, sp the, the um, backbone of the snake. So it has this hourglass pattern. Um, this in the middle, it's actually a little video clip, but um, I'm, I'm not gonna show it. It's, it's sadly a copperhead that was actually hit um, on Hawk Mountain Road. Um, in general, many snakes are often on the roads, especially when they're trying to heat up. So please watch uh, when you're driving. Um, and then here is another picture of a copperhead. And you can see 
Um, it's just kind of comparing it, comparing it to um, a young Eastern uh, rat snake, um, which does have, you know, sometimes people get confused with those markings as well. The timber rattlesnake, which is definitely, I would say, the most commonly encountered venomous snake in Pennsylvania. Um, oh, look at this is such a great photo. Um, look at that vertical slit. Um, heat sensing pit, triangular shaped head, venomous. Okay, so this is a little video of, um, this is Sean Grace again, that he's always running into snakes. I'll show this. Got a beautiful rattlesnake, Eastern timber rattlesnake, right here on Hawk Mountain Road. So we're gonna try to get him safely off the road. Okay, short little video. And also I'm going to um, stop my screen share for a second because I wanna show something else. I wanna show a really cool video that um, Tiana alerted me to that she's involved with, with her science team. Um, and it's on YouTube. And um, uh, my field technician and uh, a, few, a few of us all decided that we would take the opportunity to make um, what we were seeing a learning experience. And thankfully, uh, my field technician, Fred Tarnaski, he's done a lot of work with education, with EMS, so um, medical professionals with safety and people in the oil and gas field, educating them, as well as the general public. So we wanted to make this learning experience for everybody. Thank you so much. And it's to teach people about rattlesnake behavior and yes. that they really are not looking to go out and attack humans. It's, it's really, you know, they're looking to do their own thing and they will retreat. It's more like when people are trying to provoke them or uh, if, they're, if people mistakenly um, step on them, they don't see them, or if they're putting their hand under a rock crevice, you never wanna do that without looking. All right, let's, wa let's play the video. So we have a timber rattlesnake right here by the rock. So I'll show some behavior. Here's Tiana off to the right, Alan to the left. And uh, as she walks by the snake, notice there's absolutely no aggression, nothing to do with her. I'm not saying anybody has to get this close, but I just want to kind of prove the point that these guys are not aggressive monsters. They don't want to bite you and they're going to let you walk by pretty much all the time. Now, if Alan were to reach down and grab that snake right now, that'd be a different story. That is not the case. So, oh, there it goes. No rattling yet. Let's see if we can get a little bit closer. It's going to move. Oh, there it goes. That's giving us the warning. Size snake, yeah. bigger than I thought. So there again, nothing to worry about. They're not going to chase you. The snake would have every reason to chase anybody around it right now. And instead, he's trying to find a way to get back in his hole. And there he goes. Now, normally I wouldn't bother them like that. We already kind of walked up on the snake, so figured it would be a good opportunity to take this video. This yeah, that. Da, 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 da. <laughs> okay, that was that was really educational. That was awesome. Okay, let me go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. Do you mind if I chime in real quick? Go for it. All right. I have like a quick question for everybody. I know you, you guys can't really answer, but what do you think is a timber rattlesnake's biggest defense? I'm moving right now. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. Can I give oh. you a call back when I'm on the road? All right, great. Bye. I don't know what that was. Uh, so uh, what is a timber rattlesnake's greatest defense? So I'm going to give you guys a minute. If you want to send it in the chat, you can. Um, but I'm just going to let you let you think about that a second. 
Um, so their biggest defense about that. <laughs> is actually their camouflage. So if a timber rattlesnake is act acting defensively, they will first try to remain still and camouflage themselves. If they're eaten by something that's trying to attack them or is getting too close, uh, they feel that it's like in their personal bubble, then they will begin to rattle. If they get too close again, or if they feel more threatened, then they will flee. So what do you think finally happens after they flee and something's still irritating them after they, they rely on their camouflage, they lay still, they rattle, they flee, then and only then will they bite <laughs> defensively. They will only do it in defense of their own life. They will not do it they, because they want to harm you as explicitly. I'm if back in New have, York in the heart of rattle. Oh, that's what that was. Sorry, I had to turn uh, that off. Oh, sorry. Oh, it was YouTube. Um, they will do it because they feel like their life is in jeopardy. They will never chase you. They will never do anything out of anything except for trying to save their own life. So I just wanted to, to let you guys know that they are a very uh, docile species out of the individuals I've worked with. Uh, many of them don't even rattle when I come across them. So it's amazing to think how many people have actually walked past them and not even known it. And that's because they rely on their camouflage and they flee and then they finally rattle and then, and only then will they bite. Thank you so much for sharing that. You're welcome. I apologize for the audio in the background. It took me a while to, uh, to get rid of that. Um, okay, so let me go back. We had one more snake to see um, for Pennsylvania. Oops, let me go back. Let me go all the way. The Last venomous snake. Who knows it? Who knows it? I do. I do. I do. I do. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Massasagua rattlesnake. So um, it's my understanding this is uh, not so commonly seen. It's one of the lesser, you know, encountered and we don't know as much about it. Um, so, but just so you, you get a visual of it, um, it is federally listed as threatened and in Pennsylvania it's endangered. It's only found in two counties. So pretty rare. So I just really quickly wanted to talk about PARS. Um, Tiana is involved with it. Um, it's this wonderful citizen science endeavor that you can be involved with to be able to understand and protect our awesome reptiles and snakes and amphibians. We need to know where they are and what species are living where. And you can do that by reporting any amphibian or reptiles that you see when you're out and about. You can just go to the PARS website and report it. And it really helps scientists understand what is happening. And this is the website, paherpsurvey.org. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. So we're, um, I just couldn't resist sharing just a few photos of some of my favorite education animals I've worked with during my career doing snake education. These are our, our Hawk Mountain trainees from last, from spring 2019. And this is a red tail boa constrictor. This is our summer camp program at Hawk Mountain last year. This is an albino red tail boa constrictor. Um, uh, this is also um, on the left, our summer camp. This is a ball python, um, also known as the royal python because Queen Cleopatra used to wear them live as bracelets. And they also have, even though it is a constrictor, they have heat sensing pits that you can see up here. That's just a picture of my daughter because she loves snakes like I do. <laughs> and then this is an albino Burmese python that got much, much bigger <laughs> in the years following that picture. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, so thank you all for listening, and I'm excited to talk to Tiana. Um, so Tiana, you are one of the most passionate people about snakes that I have ever met. So why do you love snakes so much, and what are some snake projects that you have been working on? So uh, my love for snakes actually began when I was young. Um, so I don't remember this all that clearly, but my grandma always tells me this story. She said that we were waiting for the bus one morning and a snake slithered across my driveway. And I thought apparently that she was gonna stomp on it, but she was actually trying to like scoot it along with her foot. And I said, no, don't kill that. It's one of God's creatures. So even as a young child, I really, uh, I had a deep respect for snakes. Um, some of the projects I've been working on, uh, again, I work with PARS, I also, I am the Northwest team lead for the Timber Rattlesnake Monitoring Project. Um, that's a collaborative uh, project with uh, East Stroudsburg University. And 
I also just do a lot of um, volunteer work. I work with a nonprofit called the Venom Institute. They're out of Hamburg, Pennsylvania, and they're partnered actually with Cabela's. So Cabela's sponsors them. And if you want to get involved with the Venom Institute or with PARS, you can, uh, you can email PARS, you can try and volunteer. Um, you can go out and just herp. And if you want to get um, involved with the Venom Institute, you can reach out to them on Facebook. Um, they're the Venom Institute for Conservation Education. And also, I just, I just have uh, my own hobby snakes, which I'm going to show you later. Uh, they are the easiest pets to own. Uh, you only need to feed them once a week. Um, they're so laid back and I just, I really enjoy being a snake owner. So uh, that's just some of the projects I've been working on and what got me interested and what keeps me interested. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I want to make sure we have lots of time to see the live snakes, but really quickly, you have some strong ties with Hawk Mountain. Do you want to very briefly kind of touch on that? I do. Uh, so I have volunteered for the past, oh, uh, seven years with a raptor rehab out of New York. I have also done the Hawk Mountain intro to raptor field techni techniques course. I completed my associates at Penn State Dubois and they are highly uh, tied to Hawk Mountain for their raptor uh, field identification course. If you wanna do uh, work with biology, highly recommend the program at Penn State Dubois because I learned a lot there. And also, um, I am going to be a trainee this fall at Hawk Mountain and I am very excited, very excited for the opportunity to work with Hawk Mountain even more. Well, we're excited to have you for sure. All right, Tiana, I think everyone's excited to meet some live snakes. I'm gonna turn it over to you for that. All righty. I gotta find her first real quick. <laughs> So this is one of my Western hognose snakes. You can actually see, can you hear her? She is hooding a little bit. And it's probably because she's due to be fed. So this species doesn't hood as much as the Eastern does. And they're not as dramatic, um, um, especially because she, she is uh, captive bred. She has been handled a lot more. Um, she's not hooding anymore. She's used to me. Um, just ignore my clock. <laughs> um, so she is not colored like a wild snake would be colored. She is what is called a super arctic. It's a form of um, just a lack of color. So she's not brown like a wild snake, a wild western hognose would be. She is black and white and she has a black tongue and it's kind of hard to see but these guys are specially adapted to have a scoop nose. I don't know if you can see that, I hope you can. Um, so that is so that they can burrow in soil and substrate and get underneath to conceal themselves. So I'm gonna let Cece hold her because I actually have another one that I'd like to show you and she's a little bigger. She's less dramatic though, she doesn't hiss and won't hood up. All right, so this is my second hognose snake. Now, I do not house these guys together because they will eat each other. There is the potential for that to happen. But you can see with her too, that she has that little shovel nose. And now that's to burrow in the soil. So comparing these guys together, if you wanna raise her up a little bit, you can see that they have different colors. She right here is what is called albino. So there is a specific gene that acts so that she lacks pigment. So she lacks darker pigments that makes her, um, so she is orange or red and she has the red eyes. There are different forms of albinism, but I won't get into that because it's pretty technical. And then there's also called leucism. Leucism means they lack pigment too, but they don't have the red colored eyes that the albinos do. So they would have blue or maybe black eyes or even brown. And then they would also lack the pigment and would generally be white. You may see that in things such as deer or um, other reptiles. So I'm going to put these back and then I'll get another snake out because I actually have four to show you guys today. And if you guys have any questions about hog noses, um, 
or anything you can ask us in the question section. We might uh, answer them at the end. Um, these guys too, uh, the Easterns are actually mistaken for venomous snakes a lot, um, but they are completely harmless. They're more dramatic than anything, honestly. If you get on YouTube, you can find a lot of videos of them being extra dramatic, them hissing or hooding up. Um, and there's even videos of Eastern hog noses where they play dead and someone tries to flip them over, um, but they flip themselves back over and then they'll writhe a little bit and they'll continue to play dead even though they, the, the person tried to flip them back over, which it's kind of funny, honestly. They're, they're pretty dramatic snakes. So the next snake I have to show you is it's completely different species. So she is what is called a banded or a tricolor hognose. She is native to South America and she also has a scoop nose. Now that's just a character that developed because um, they, they had similar needs for burrowing. But this, uh, this girl is actually not super closely related to the other hognoses. She just has um, the same name and the same sort of scoop nose. So as you can see by her color, she is red, black, and white. So what's the old rhyme? Red touch yellow, kill a fellow. Red touch black, good for Jack. Well, that's not exactly true. Um, anywhere south of Texas, you will find coral snakes that are all black, that have black and yellow, black and white, or just red. And there are also individuals in the United States that may be all, all black, just like how my snakes are different, how the one is red and then the other, or red and white, and then the other is black and white. There are wild snakes that can be different too. So if you don't know what a snake is, again, just make sure you don't handle it. But as you can see, with the coloration, she looks just like a coral snake. And that's a protection because if something is bitten by a coral snake, it'll learn. It'll learn not to bite something that looks like that. So they form, animals will form an image using this color in their head to avoid. So that co red coloration and the, the banding means avoid. So it helps keep her from being eaten even though she's not dangerous or not as dangerous as a coral snake. So. Uh, also, she's got, it's hard to tell, but she has very smooth scales, so she's actually almost feels soft. But I'm going to put her back real quick. And again, if you guys have any questions, um, you can ask us in the Q&A, and we'll try to answer those at the end. I do have one more snake to show you. Um, I did just acquire it recently, so just be aware that it may be a little jumpy. Um, I own this animal under a specific permit. So this is an Eastern milk snake. Jamie covered this earlier in her presentation. It's native to Pennsylvania. And I actually rescued this individual from a roadway. So I wanted to keep it just for this presentation. I'll release it eventually. Um, it is a little spooked. It's not used to being held. It is a wild individual. You should never ever keep a wild individual as a pet ever. They make horrible, horrible pets. Um, but you can see by its coloration, that it has what are called saddles. So it looks a little similar to a copperhead, but it is completely different. It is harmless. And as you can see, it wants to do nothing. It wants nothing to do with me. It just wants to flee. And I'd actually prefer not to stress the snake out too much. So I'm going to put it back. But if you guys have any questions about native species, mimicry, um, hog noses, um, copperhead lookalikes, feel free to ask us in the questions and we'll try to answer those at the end. Tiana, thank you so much, and thank you for sharing your snakes with us. I love meeting them. So I also have some snake educators to share. This is Beetlejuice, and take a look. Beetlejuice is gorgeous. Beetlejuice is a northern pine snake, not native to Pennsylvania, um, lives in Pennsylvania, um, on the coastal plains, on, in the um, sandy soil areas, uh, in the Jersey pine grove. Um, Pine Barrens is where there is one of the, the last big habitats closest to here. And then they can be found all the way down south into the southern states. 
Um, so this snake is threatened in New Jersey and is also a species of concern federally. And, um, you know, they have a really cool adaptation and there's a reason why they love to live in areas with sandy soil. Many snakes actually don't dig their own burrows. They'll take over the burrow uh, that another critter made, but um, like some of the other snakes uh, Tiana showed you, this snake has a special adaptation on its nose. It has, it has a, a really strong head, uh, neck, and a very pointy nose, and that's for digging. So it has to be in an area um, with sandy soil, and it prefers areas that doesn't have a lot of uh, vegetation um, so that it can burrow underground and, and make the nest. And it also has a really strong uh, scale rostral uh, uh, scale over the front of its nose that can really help and protect it when it's digging. So it's, um, this is a threatened species in New Jersey, and some of the threats really have to do with humans. Um, and what a beautiful snake. Um, and it can get to be pretty long. Um, so first of all, people see it and they're scared, and sometimes people kill things they're scared of, which you, you shouldn't do. You know, the snakes are such an important part of the ecosystem. So this is, is not venomous. This is a constrictor, but when it feels threatened, it's going to mimic a venomous snake. It's going to flatten out its head to look triangular, and then it's going to vibrate its tail really fast and squeeze air out of its lungs to make a rattling sound. So it's mimicking a rattlesnake. So sometimes if, if people see that and start messing with it, they're like, they'll kill it because they think it's dangerous. It's not dangerous at all. In fact, it's helpful. It's controlling rodent populations. Another reason they're threatened is because of loss of habitat and habitat conversion, um, human persecution, hunting, and also people using all-terrain vehicles, um, off-roading has really had a negative impact on the species. But lovely, beautiful, beautiful animal. Um, and I hope you really enjoyed meeting Beetlejuice. More snakes coming. Okay. Next, I'm going to show you another snake that is not native to Pennsylvania, but can be found in New Jersey, all the way uh, down south um, and in central parts of the country. And perhaps you'll recognize this snake from uh, the presentation. Uh, this is sherbet, and sherbet is a corn snake. Um, so this is not necessarily the color of this. And by the way, I should start by saying all these snakes, the three snakes I'm going to show you were not wild. These were all um, pet snakes that needed a home. Okay, these were not taken from the wild, but they needed a home. And then I adopted them and they've been working with me for many years as education animals. So sherbet is a corn snake, a partial albinism, and that's often bred for specifically for the pet trade with the pretty colors. Uh, but regular corn snakes are kind of like the color of fall leaves, kind of in the background of the, the lookout from North Lookout, dark reds. Um, and look at his tongue. What is he doing with his tongue? Snakes smell with their tongue, and maybe you can see they actually have a forked tongue, and that helps with directionality of smelling. Oh, it smells more like a mouse to the left or the right. Snakes have an organ in the mouth, on the roof of their mouth, called the Jacobson organ, which helps them interpret what it is that they're smelling or tasting. And that's, um, many snakes are nocturnal, so they really rely on their uh, sense of smell to find their prey. Um, so hmm, the name corn snake, well, um, they got their name, one theory is, is that they were often found in farm areas um, where um, farmers were storing their grain and their corn, and the snakes, they're not eating the, the, the grain or the corn, but they're eating the rodents, the mice and the rats and the other rodents that are coming to eat the, the storage of the farmer's food. So they're actually a really a great friend for farmers. So that's how they got their name, the corn snake. Also, this one with the partial albinoism, you can't really see it so well, but another theory is they often have this um, like a pattern on their stomach that kind of looks uh, like Indian corn colors. So that's, that's another reason, but lovely snake can get to be pretty long, can get to be about six feet long. Um, in the wild, they might live maybe six to eight years, but in captivity, they could live 20, 30 years. And I wish you could feel this, their skin, their scales are just so, um, they feel so nice and smooth and they're really beautiful. All right, I have one more snake to share with you all. And I've had this snake for 12 years. This snake 
was um, caught on a gluey mouse trap in an apartment building in Allentown. And I happened to be working as a conservation educator at the time for the Lehigh Valley Zoo. And I was doing an outreach program in Allentown. And after the program, some people that were in the audience, they said, hey, come here. There's this little snake that was caught on a gluey mouse trap uh, in this apartment building. Can you take it back to the zoo? Well, the zoo wasn't interested in having another snake. So I adopted Catalina. And um, she's been with me ever since as an education animal. So we weren't sure what species of snake it was. So my friends at the zoo, the herpetologists who study reptiles and amphibians helped me determine the species. And they determined it to be an albino bull snake. And albino bull snakes in the wild uh, live in the central part of the United States all the way up into southern Canada and all the way down into northern Mexico. So not from here. So most likely an escape pet and particularly with this albi pretty albino uh, colors um, which is deliberately bred for pets. So an escape pet and also it has this oval scale right on the top of its head which helped um, us identify it as a bull snake. Bull snakes have really thick um, heads and um, you can see she's been starting to shed. Her shed wasn't complete. Um, beautiful, really long snake. I mean, she's like going to be like eight feet long once she's done growing. Um, really beautiful. And another thing that's really cool in adaptation of snakes, if you can see um, her scales, the shape of her scales on her back, they're kind of like, um, like diamond-like or ovular, like an oval. But then if you turn, and they're smaller, if you flip her over on the belly, you can see that the scales are like long, big, long rectangles. So those belly scales are special scales called scoots. And you can think of them functionality as serving like the tread of a tire. It helps them grip the ground as they're moving or climb a tree. So bull snakes, you know, they don't look like this typically in the wild. An albino bull snake would be certainly not camouflaged well and would be predated pretty quickly. Um, so their regular colors are um, kind of brownish, maybe some yellowish, some blotches of white and black, reddish. Some people think they look similar to a rattlesnake. So unfortunately, people kill them because people are just scared of rattlesnakes and that's harmful to these species. But you, you know what else? Just similar um, to other snakes, they also mimic rattlesnakes. In the wild, when they're feeling threatened, they'll flatten out their head, they'll vibrate their tail really fast, like so fast it almost looks like blurred and they'll, they'll push air out of their lungs to make a rattling sound. So that's one of their uh, defense mechanisms. And unfortunately that makes people think that they are rattlesnakes and people unfortunately do then persecute them. But really wonderful, lovely, lovely snake. I hope you enjoyed meeting Catalina. Um, so man, we have had um, such a great program. Thank you so, so many people for being with us today. There, there are so many questions. I haven't had a chance to look through them. I know that we're not going to have time to get through all of them. I will say, please feel free to uh, write me at Hawk Mountain. Um, oh my goodness. Um, what is the maximum lifespan of a snake is one of the questions. And I would say that really depends on species. In the wild, um, animals don't live as long as in captivity where they're getting regular meals. Um, and vet care. Um, I would say in captivity, a snake like this could live into uh, the twenties, um, but in, in the wild, um, like I, I know some species of snake can live six to eight years in the wild. And Tiana, feel free to jump in if, uh, mm -hmm. if you um, want to add anything. Um, I'm not sure, do you know what is the most venomous snake in the world, Tiana? So with venom, there's actually a lot of things to consider. There isn't one most venomous. It's more, um, so there's toxicity, which is how potent something is. So say you have a bee, you have one bee. So it's, it's gonna hurt when it stings you. But then there's dose, so you have 100 bees. So there's a snake, right? If it only has a little bit of venom and it's only kind of toxic, it's not gonna do much to you. If it has a, a little bit of venom and it's pretty toxic, it still might not do anything to you. But if it has a lot of venom and it's not very toxic, it might make you sick. But it ha if it has a lot of venom and it's very toxic, it'll make you very sick. So there's a lot of things to consider with venom toxicity and dose. There's no one most venomous. That's the only answer I can give you. There's a lot of things online that will say 
you know, like King Cobra or the Tercio Palo or um, like the banded sea crate. Um, but that's all subjective really until research, more research is done. Awesome. Thank you so much for uh, sharing that. So this is a question for you, uh, Tiana, because you were talking about your snakes hooding when you were showing your snakes. What is hooding? Um, what, what do you mean by that? Um, they'll just flatten their, their neck. Um, so uh, you know how you look at a snake and it's like this? Well, when it's uh, being defensive, it might flatten it out like that. So it might appear to have a triangle head, but in all reality, it's just faking it. Okay, <laughs> so that's gotcha. like, like hooding. Um, that's just another word for flattening their, their neck. All right, thank you. So here's another question related to when you were talking about uh, the hognose and also with my slide, how it was playing dead. So when some snakes like the hognose play dead, um, how does that work? Because wouldn't the predator be like, hey, it's already dead. This is a free meal. Why does it work? Because wouldn't it make the predators think, oh, this, I'm going to eat it now because it's already dead. <laughs> um, so when they're, play when they're playing dead, they'll actually defecate on themselves. And when they defecate, they release a really foul smelling liquid. And that's what makes them also smell dead and unappealing to eat. That does sound unappealing. <laughs> yeah, they're not fun to pick up. I wouldn't recommend picking up like a garter snake or a hognose. They, they really smell bad. Most snakes, all snakes that I can think of have some form of musk. It's just uh, some are more apt or more prone to do it first. And then others are a little bit more laid back. But until you understand um, like the species in an area and understand like how to identify them, I just recommend not messing with them. Um, again, because you know, you want to be sure what you're dealing with. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Uh, one more question. There was tons of questions and I do apologize for the answer. We don't have time for all. Uh, but what, we have a question about fangs. Tiana, do all snakes have fangs? So... And wait, can I add something too? I'm combining two questions. And um, when snakes are born or they hatch, do they have their teeth? That was another question. They, they do <laughs> have teeth. They do have teeth. Um, mm -hmm. So there are snakes that are called aglyphous, meaning they don't have fangs they still have teeth. Then there's proteroglyphus. Those are snakes like um, the king cobra. They have fixed fangs in the front and then they don't go back. Then there's opistho opistoglyphus snakes like my hog noses. They have rear fangs, but they don't have venom that's significant to people. It will only really work on their prey items. If you were bit by a hog nose, it would only maybe cause you a little bit of an itch, or if you're allergic, it might cause something else. But typically, they're not going to bite unless you smell like a mouse. So again, they have rear fangs. They do not inject venom either, and neither do cobras. They, they don't have like um, fangs that have a hole in them. Um, it's more so like um, a groove. So they have to kind of chew on you. And then uh, the last type of uh, fang, there's four different, four different uh, like uh, teeth types in snakes, is selenoglyphus. That's what rattlesnakes have. So when you see a rattlesnake yawn, it's like this, right? And then their fangs go out and then they fold back in. So they have fangs that are basically like little hypodermic needles that they can fold out and then they can fold back in. When they fold them back in, they go right back into their mouth. Um, so yeah, uh, that's how they inject their venom. And that's with the pit vipers, they just fold out and go back in. Wow. Tiana, you know so much about fangs and venom. I'm impressed. <laughs> so thank you so much. And I think that about wraps it up for today. Tiana, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation and sharing your snake expertise and your snake education animals with us. And thank you, Cece, for being a wonderful assistant with the snakes. Thank you to our wonderful audience for joining us today. We really appreciate it. If you want to learn more about rattlesnakes in Pennsylvania, uh, Dr. LaDuke um, from East Strasburg University is our featured speaker for one of our autumn lecture series this fall. And um, let's see, I can get that date. That's uh, Saturday, September 19th, Rattlesnake Conservation in Pennsylvania. You don't want to miss that. We have a variety of uh, virtual programs coming up soon, like tomorrow. <laughs> so here's what we have going on in the next week. Tomorrow, Thursday, June 11th, we have Sanctuary Storytime. Percy the Victorious Vulture at 11 o'clock a.m. And then this Friday, June 12th, we have Galaxy of Falcons with Scott Weidensall, which is going to be awesome at 4 o'clock p.m. 
Then next Wednesday, June 17th, we have PA Dutch Pow Wow with Porcupine Pat of the Schuylkill County Conservation District. And next Friday, June 19th, we have Learning Bird Song by Habitat with Holly Merker. So a lot of great things coming up. Thank you so much. And remember, our trails are open at Hawk Mountain. Check out our website for details. Um, there are some modifications with social distancing and the way we're uh, taking uh, ticket sales. Check out our website. We hope to see you soon and thank you for joining us. Bye for now. Bye. <laughs>